Thank you for joining us today. I'm Greg Condra, president of the Louisville Forum. We meet the second Wednesday of every month at noon at Vincenzo's Restaurant. The Louisville Forum is a nonpartisan public issues group founded in 1984. Louisville Forum hosts debates and discussions of contemporary and sometimes controversial public policy issues that affect the greater Louisville community. Although we may take up issues that have a national interest, we try to highlight the local perspective. For more information on the Louisville Forum, our programs, or to make reservations, please visit our website, louisvilleforum.org. Claims of sexual assault on campus and due process. To quote the New York Times, few issues in education today are as intensely debated as the way colleges deal with sexual misconduct. Betsy DeVos, U.S. Education Secretary, rescinded Obama area guidelines on campus sexual assault, saying they violated principles of fairness. She lifted the requirement that colleges use the lowest standard of proof, preponderance of the evidence. Colleges are now free to demand more convincing evidence. A growing core of legal experts and defense lawyers have argued that the Obama rules created a culture in which the accused were presumed guilty. Before I turn it over to our moderator, Tom Van Der Rostein today, who will provide some more background and introduce our expert panel, I want to introduce our questioners today. They are Stacy Huff and Joe Marks over here. So, Tom? Thank you, Greg. Uh, as Greg said, my name is Tom Van Der Rostein. I'm the moderator for today's program. Uh, recently, the topic of sexual harassment and assault have been front and center in the national news. Reports of sexual misconduct have been made against individuals of all stripes, persuasions, and political parties, coming in on an almost daily basis. Most notably, Harvey Weinstein, Louis C.K., Judge Roy Moore, Senator Al Franken, President Bill Clinton, and President Donald Trump and others have all been accused of varying degrees of misconduct. These accusations have led to the Me Too movement and to even more women coming forward with their accounts of sexual misconduct or harassment, which they have endured. We are here today to discuss the topic of claims of sexual assault on campus and due process. Since 1987, six national studies, including one in 2016 by the Department of Justice, show that as many as one in four or five college women are sexually assaulted while attending college. Most of these sexual assaults are never reported to any authority. Some critics allege that these statistics are exaggerated, that they define sexual assault too broadly, or that a sizable percentage of sexual allegations are false. I think, however, all of us can agree that sexual assault and the claims of sexual assault are a serious issue for all parties concerned, and that more can and should be done. In a recent study conducted at the University of Kentucky for the academic year of 2015-16, 837, or 3.6% of over 23,000 students who participated in the study reported being sexually assaulted. Only 20% of those reported the assault to any UK source. Just over 1% went to the Lexington police, and over 60% only told a friend or family member. Since 2011, most universities and colleges have conducted administrative procedures and hearings regarding student sexual misconduct consistent with the guidance given in a 19-page 2011 letter from the U.S. Department of Education, one provision of which was that the standard of proof in said hearings was to be a preponderance of the evidence standard. Since 2011, a number of concerns have been raised by different groups and politicians regarding those guidelines, including whether or not they violate the due process of the accused, and whether colleges and universities should investigate and hold hearings involving student sexual assault at all. In September of this year, uh, U.S. Department of Education Secretary Betsy DeVos issued a two-page letter, which among other things withdrew the preponderance of evidence standard as the mandatory minimum burden of proof in those hearings. To discuss this important issue today and to help us understand it more, I would like to introduce the members of today's panel. Please give a warm welcome first to Elizabeth Howell, Gretchen Hunt, and Jonathan Andrews. Uh, uh, Mitch Hunt will speak first. Uh, Gretchen Hunt is from the Office of the Kentucky Attorney General. She heads the Victim of, Office of, of Victims Advocacy. Ms. Hunt has advocated for the rights of the victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, and human trafficking for the past 15 years. 
She has worked at the Center for Women and Families, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, and the Kentucky Association of Sexual Assault Programs. She's a past recipient of the Leadership Award of the Kentucky Women's Law Enforcement Network and the Liberation Award from the Kentucky Rescue and Restore for her work on human trafficking and was recently awarded Member of the Year by the Women Lawyers Association. In addition to her work with victims, she has taught courses on gender in the law and domestic violence at the University of Louisville, the Brandeis School of Law. She's a graduate of Boston College Law School. Please welcome Gretchen Hunt. Thank you so much to Tom and to Greg for this invitation and for such a timely panel. Um, and I think the lessons that we're going to talk about today are applicable not just on college campuses, but in any institution um, that we could look at. And I, and I want to specifically thank the young folks in this room. I have done this work now for 17 years, and you all are the reason I do this work. So I dedicate my remarks to you today. Um, and as the mother of a, ten, of a nine year old daughter and a 12 year old boy, I also do this work for them and get up every day to fight for the rights of survivors because I believe that a better, safer world is possible. So again, I thank you for the opportunity. Theodore Roosevelt said many, many years ago, but it's relevant today, we Americans have many grave problems to solve, many threatening evils to fight, and many deeds to do, if, as we hope and believe, we have the wisdom, the strength, and the courage and the virtue to do them. But we must face facts as they are. So what are the facts on campus sexual assault? Tom mentioned some of them, but I, be, I want to begin with what are the facts that we know about the scope of this problem? Um, it's not just one study, it's, it's multiple studies, climate surveys, and prevalence data that let us know that nearly one in five college women will experience sexual violence in their time in undergraduate college. That does not encompass those who come to college with prior experiences of sexual violence in high school or at the hands of a family member or a known person during their childhood. Nearly one in 16 men will also face sexual violence in collegiate years. So when I talk to you about my concern being for young people, it is equally for the men and women on our college campuses, and indeed in K through 12, which is also covered by Title IX, something we'll not talk about today, but a grave issue as well. Um, my concern is for the safety and well-being for both of those folks. What are the facts about the impact of sexual violence? Sexual violence is the costliest crime, and this is according to the FBI and many studies. So when I say that, I say in for, the, for the plaintiff's attorneys or folks out in the room who quantify harms to individuals, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, General Bashir doesn't like it when I talk about the cost of sexual violence um, because he believes that you know, it's the violation of the person, but I do think it's worth noting that sexual violence among all crimes is the costliest at about 151,000 um, suffered by victims in terms of lost educational time, lost wages, medical costs, including physical health care costs, but mental health costs. And that gives us a sense of what are the facts around the gravity of this crime and the impact. Victims of sexual assault on campus are more likely to suffer academically and um, experience depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and are more likely to drop out and to receive a, a hit in their educational career. We talked a little bit about reporting. So what are the, the, what are the statistics around reporting? Well, in Kentucky, we have eight public universities. And in the latest data that we have, um, schools, and Elizabeth will talk about this a little bit more, have duties to report under the Cleary Act, um, acts of sexual violence, crimes of sexual of violence that occur on campus. So what are the facts and numbers around that? Well, in the latest data in 2015, we had 73 reported offenses under Cleary of forcible sex offenses. Um, in Kentucky as a whole, across Kentucky to Kentucky State Police, 4,709 forcible sex offenses were reported in 2015, which means a forcible sex offense was committed approximately every two hours. So 73 reports um, made to Cleary. Those were not all made to law enforcement. Now to law enforcement, only 36 sexual assaults 
were reported to Kentucky law enforcement on college campuses. So what the facts indicate to us is if we have this high prevalence of sexual violence and low rates of reporting, it is a fact to say that we have a crisis in, in terms of these rapes not being reported either on college campuses or to criminal law enforcement. Now, a little bit of a context as well. Um, numbers tell an important story. And for those of you in the room who are survivors, and yes, there are survivors of sexual violence in this room. Um, yes, professionals in our community can also experience victimization. You will know this to be true. If you work in the field as I do, not a day has gone by since about two months ago when the Harvey Weinstein scandal broke that I have not received a text message or a Facebook message from a colleague from someone with whom I work disclosing a prior experience of rape or sexual violence and seeking to be heard or to seek services. So we know that anecdotally, but what do the numbers tell us? Well, the CDC did the most comprehensive survey on intimate partner violence and rape um, back in 2011. And what they found is 47% of Kentucky women between the ages of 18 and 45 will experience sexual violence in their lifetime. And when I say sexual violence, this is referring to sex crimes by the FBI definition. So what we're talking about is a high prevalence. We are talking about the facts and the scope of this problem is that there is an epidemic of sexual violence in Kentucky. Um, there's also facts that, that are relevant when we look at um, what the state of Kentucky is in terms of law enforcement around sexual assault. So for example, our laws do not require any standards for what happens when a sex crime is reported to law enforcement. By that I mean there is no requirement that a report be taken. There is no requirement that there be an interview of a victim. There is no requirement that there be an interview of a suspect or any minimum standard for investigation. Um, it is very true, and we've seen it in the context of the rape kit backlog, of which our office is, is working diligently to address, um, that there are systems problems um, in terms of what happens when sexual assaults are reported to law enforcement. And we should not doubt that this is also impacting those decisions of victims who do come forward. So how do we attack this problem? If we know that the facts indicate that there's high prevalence of sexual violence, both on campus and in the larger community in Kentucky, that there's a crisis of a lack of reporting, um, that there's a lack of clear processes even when people do report to law enforcement off campus. Um, there's also a lack of data and transparency. So you will hear on this panel a lot, but here's the truth. Um, I could stand up here and talk to you about anecdotes of victims who've contacted our office or contacted me when I worked at the Sexual Assault Coalition um, about gaps and problems in the Title IX process. Elizabeth could give those examples. Jonathan could give those examples. But here's the facts. We actually don't know. We do not have data on what are the outcomes of Title IX investigations on campus. There's no transparency on that end. Um, the fact is right now that colleges just have to report how many cases are reported to them. Many are triaged out, um, screened out before they go to Title IX processes, um, and there's no transparency on the tail end. So how do we confront this problem? Well, I'll talk to you about a few things that we are doing at the Office of the Attorney General. Um, first and foremost, we are leading from the top. So General Bashir, when he came into office in January 16, said that justice for victims of rape and sexual assault was one of his four missions for the office. Leadership from the top, speaking out about sexual violence, has been proven again and again, whether it's in the military context or in the context of, of clergy abuse, that leadership from the top sets the tone about justice for victims and survivors. We have um, consistently reached out to our public universities through both training and public awareness outreach. So I have traveled from Moorhead to Murray, for those of you who know that, that's a long drive, um, from east to west in the state, offering training and technical assistance on the laws, both the criminal process, the civil process, and Title IX. We have done awareness campaigns, and should you think that these things are just a drop in the bucket, we are seeing movement and change. We have done a voice of justice contest, video contest of college students who are talking about how they will protect each other, be their brother and sister's keeper. And I will tell you that there's evidence that some of this is working. And by working, I say that this is changing the 
addressing the problem of sexual assault and changing the narrative and changing rates of reporting in this way. It is a problem that we have such low rates of reporting on campus. But what we're finding from our work, and we just did a three-day training for teams of law enforcement prosecutors and victim advocates, is that when you train law enforcement in new techniques, law enforcement have been trained for decades on how to interrogate suspects. That does not work with a trauma survivor. Um, and so when we're now training law enforcement with trauma-informed techniques, how to really elicit testimony and elicit information, they are being able to put together much more comprehensive cases. So a recent case that just came out of one of our trainings um, happened by a law enforcement prosecutor and victim advocate who'd never worked together before. And when they, after they went to our training, they went back to their community in Moorhead a campus sexual assault was reported. They did a different form of interview. They were able to get the victim a protective order to accompany her, to have her report on campus, and the perpetrator, alleged perpetrator, was arrested that night. Now, there's a lot that we know of what works to address this problem of campus sexual assault. Another promising practice is something born in Kentucky. It's called the Green Dot Program. It's also implemented in Kentucky high schools. It's the only CDC studied program of bystander intervention that has been proven to reduce sexual violence perpetration before it ever starts. Let me be clear, I want to put myself out of a job. I want all of us to be out of a job. We should be engaged in the business of stopping this before it starts. The same way we have stopped and limited smoking in Kentucky or other public health crises. Um, so the Green Dot program is a helpful intervention. And I'll, I'll close my remarks, and, and many of us could speak for much more at length about the scope of sexual assault on campus and what can be done. But I want to close by saying that, that we know what are some solutions to this problem, and it is important how we frame the problem. I would submit to you that the problem that we're talking about is a problem of rampant sexual violence that occurs in our culture with impunity. Um, what I did not um, talk about at the beginning is actually, in addition to that low rate of reporting to law enforcement, in Kentucky, and this is data from the Statistical Analysis Center of the um, Justice and Public Safety Cabinet of Kentucky, we convict in 3% of sex crimes cases in Kentucky. 3%. Um, now, if I submit to you that if I said that happened in Afghanistan or in Mexico, we would be quick to judge those cultures. We need to look internally. Um, and it is possible to move the needle, to address this problem, to attack it, to seek justice for victims, accountability for perpetrators in a fair and just way. Um, and the best place for us to look at that is in the military, which has increased rates of reporting, has increased protections for survivors, including appointing special victims counsel in hearings there, and they have decreased rates of sexual violence. Lastly, the lessons that we learn on campus are applicable in the workplace. Um, the crisis of sexual harassment, which is engulfing our communities right now, a vastly unreported crime, um, a vastly unreported problem, has lessons in it. And in fact, the EOC report that came out just a year or two ago on promising practices to address sexual violence actually pointed to the work that's been done on college campuses to do bystander intervention training campus climate surveys and other efforts. So what we learn on colleges is as applicable for all of our workplaces. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hunt. And now our next speaker will be Elizabeth Howell. Elizabeth Howell is a practicing attorney with the law firm of Diana Skaggs and Partners. She obtained her Juris Doctor degree from the University of Illinois. She University of Illinois College of Law. Besides her professional practice, Ms. Howell is involved with the Louisville community through her pro, pro bono work on Title IX, working on behalf of survivors of on-campus sexual violence and assault. Her work includes presentations to area attorneys and law school classes on how Title IX can be utilized to assist survivors. Please give a warm welcome to Elizabeth Howell. Thank you so much for having me, and a special thanks to Tom for, for organizing and coordinating. Before I start, I did want to just make a quick note on language, because I think language really matters. You'll probably, um, throughout my talk, hear me talk about victims of sexual assault, um, and a lot of advocates use the word survivor. But for me, when my clients come to me, they're still very much a victim. They're in a very scary and confusing process. Um, 
and so because that's where I see them, that's the language I use. Additionally, I think with the Me Too movement and a lot of what's been happening, we as a society place an onus on survivors of sexual assault to tell us their stories, but they don't owe us anything. Um, survivors of sexual assault both have the choice to share their story and speak out, or they have the choice to remain silent if that's what they need in the healing process. So that's why you'll probably hear me say victim in, instead of a word like survivor or complaint. And um, when I say respondent, I'm talking about the student who is responding to the complaint of sexual assault. So at most universities, the victim is either the complaint or the victim. In some cases, the university is the complaint, and the response student is called the respondent. So before I um, started using the language, I wanted to make sure we were all familiar with it. I'm going to start by talking about why colleges address sexual assault in the first place. Because a common question that I get asked a lot when I'm out speaking is, this seems like it's a matter for law enforcement. It seems like a matter for our justice system. This is, this is a crime. Why isn't it being reported to the police? Why aren't we dealing with it as a criminal matter? Well, Title IX of the Education Amendment of 1972 was signed into law by President Nixon. It states that no person in the United States shall be on the basis of sex, excluded from participation in, denied the benefit of, or be subject to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Subsequently, in case law, the federal financial assistance definition was defined, and we now know that it's it's really broad, so Title IX applies not only to public universities, but to most private universities and colleges as well. It also applies in K through 12 education, although that's not the focus of what we're talking about today. Schools everywhere have a responsibility to ensure that students aren't being discriminated on on the basis of sex, and if their educational benefits are being deprived, schools have a burden to, to deal with that. Um, a fun fact is that it was renamed the Patsy Mink Equal, Equal Opportunity and Education Act in 2012. Um, Patsy Mink was the co-author in the U.S. House and the late sponsor of the bill. Um, Based on a lot of what I read in media, it seems like there's a mixed conception that Title IX is new or that we just started enforcing it, but it was passed way back in the 70s um, and it's been enforced with, with regularity since then. Of course, in case law, um, things have been changed and been clarified, but it's certainly something that's been around for a while. Schools have long handled all kinds of disciplinary matters. Um, sometimes I hear that sexual assault is so serious, schools aren't equipped to deal with it. Well, schools have to deal with lots of serious things. Um, many schools have a student code of conduct which prohibits activity from sexual assault to doing drugs to plagiarism. And schools adjudicate all kinds of issues. Um, there are even some cases where a school adjudication process may need to deal with a serious crime like murder because the school needs to ensure that students on their campus are protected and the criminal system works slowly. Um, an advantage of the school system is that it has to be prompt and equitable so it works much more quickly than the criminal system um, and can protect students without having to wait for a criminal adjudication. Another important reason schools need to address this issue is because they can provide interim remedies that law enforcement cannot. So for example, when a client comes to me, they're often a freshman, we have something called the red zone, which is the first couple of weeks on campus. And we know that, that students are much more likely to be sexually assaulted in the first couple weeks on campus than at any other point in their collegiate career. Um, so I usually have a very young client, She's 18, she's probably away from home for the first time without the support network of the parents or friends that she grew up with um, and, and has absolutely no idea what to do. Unfortunately, we regularly have victims who first turn to a professor or a coach or someone at the university who instead of encouraging them to report or explaining the process to them makes a comment like, oh, well, you were drinking, weren't you? Or, oh, but you're dating. Um, and, and isn't met with the support she needs initially. 
Schools can, however, provide counseling, they can change classes, they can change housing. If you have been assaulted on a college campus, you may be in a situation where you run into the person who raped or assaulted you in the lunch line at the cafeteria every day. And that's not something the criminal justice system can do a lot to fix, but it's something that schools can fix fairly easily. I'm gonna move into talking a little bit about due process as that's the, the highlight for today. Schools um, under the law, of course, have to guarantee fundamental fairness to all students facing long-term expulsion from school. Um, it's, attending school is a right, it's protected by due process. It is, however, very different from the due process someone in the criminal judicial system would be entitled to. Case law tells us that um, students who are accused of sexual assault are entitled to minimum due process. Um, at minimum, they have the opportunity to be heard at a meaningful time and in a meaningful manner, and um, an opportunity to share some version of their events. So kind of the short way to remember it is there must be an opportunity to respond, explain, and defend. School adjudication processes differ significantly from university to one from to another university. Um, so part of what Gretchen was talking about earlier with the transparency issue is that one student's experience at University of Kentucky may be very different than a student's experience at University of Louisville because there are two different adjudication systems in place. So federal courts have said broadly minimal due process needs to be met. There's a new University of Cincinnati case that does discusses that um, and I really recommend taking a look if you're interested in this issue because it goes through in detail exactly what schools need to do to be compliant with minimal due process. Outside of case law, um, the U.S. Department of Education has generated a lot of guidances and letters that actually give additional rights to both the victims I represent and the student who are responding. And the first guidance came out in 1997. It defined quid pro quo quo harassment, as well as the hostile environment sexual harassment, um, which is essentially, it's harassment if it's sufficiently severe, persistent, or persuasive enough to limit a student's ability to participate in or benefit from education. That was filed by the 2001 guidance, and I apologize, I'm just checking on time. <laughs> I have a lot to get through here. Um, the 2001 guidance delineated the factors that schools use to consider evaluation in a hostile environment and also discussed welcomeness. So the Department of Education recognizes that if we have a kindergarten student who is being propositioned by a teacher, that may be a different situation than if we have a college student who's being propositioned by another college student. Um, so there are lots of factors and, and in any situation, school's <laughs> obligation is to look at the totality of the circumstances. So you often hear that, oh, well, even handing another student a valentine is illegal under Title IX. Well, that's not really the case. We would take the totality of the circumstances into effect. So if that student had previously raped a student and then handed them a valentine and the school hadn't done anything to prevent that from happening, you know, maybe then the totality of the circumstances would, would point to some kind of internal grievance needing to occur. Um, but it certainly takes into account a whole host of, of complex issues and evidence. That was followed by the 2011 guidance, which is most commonly known as the Dear Colleague Letter. Typically, um, when you're hearing about administrative guidance in terms of Title IX, they are referring to this Dear Colleague Letter. However, most of what the Dear Colleague Letter discusses is an expansion of the previous guidance. That was rescinded and replaced by a temporary order in 2017 by Betsy DeVos, so we are now operating under that order. Um, there were some changes which I'm happy to address in questions. I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time here. Um, there's also the Cleary Act, which Gretchen mentioned earlier, which mandates reporting. One really important thing to note about the Cleary Act is it doesn't mandate that schools report anything that happens in campus-sponsored sp housing. So a lot of campuses have housing where there's a third-party affiliate who runs the housing 
housing, but it appears to be on campus and students think it's part of campus, but it's not. If a sexual assault occurs in a location like that, the school does have responsibility under Title IX, but they don't have a responsibility to report that under the Clery Act. So that's probably influencing the number of reports we'll see. And the other key piece of language here is the Violence Against Reauthorization Act of 2013, which is commonly known as the SAVE Act. It updated the Clery and did things like um, made clear the definition of stalking. It also um, stated that proceedings shall be prompt, fair, and have an impartial investigation. I am going to leave it at that for now, but I hope you have lots of questions. Um, there are a lot of common myths out there about Title IX or how campus grievance procedures work, um, and I'm, I'm happy to address any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Howell. Our next speaker is Jonathan Andrews. Mr. Andrews is a former Hanover College student and is a volunteer activist and on the board of directors for FACE, Families Advocating for Campus Equality, and advocates for safe, stop abusive and violent environments. Jonathan was also one of the individuals who met with Secretary DeVos prior to the Department of Education's announcement withdrawing the guidelines imposed by the Obama administration. John, uh, Mr. Andrews has also appeared on radio and television for his cause. Please welcome, give a warm welcome to Mr. Andrews. I get my timer up here just to be sure. <clears throat> Again, uh, my name is John Andrews, and now I have over two years of experience in working on Title IX issues on both the federal and state level. Um, as it was mentioned before, I have consulted with the Department of Education, uh, specifically Secretary DeVos and Assistant Secretary Jackson. I've had the opportunity to meet with congressional offices in D.C., as well as dozens of state legislators across the nation. Uh, most importantly, in my opinion, is my work with Families Advocating for Campus Equality, which is a nonprofit organization that advocates for greater due process protections in campus proceedings. I do need to preface, though, that though I'm a board member and a very proud member of FACE, I'm not speaking wholly on behalf of that organization today. Unfortunately, though, I also have some personal experience with Title IX. For me, it started in January of 2015, when I was sexually assaulted by a fellow member of Sigma Chi fraternity at Hanover College, just a few miles north of here. Despite numerous attempts to report my assault, I was stonewalled by fraternity officials who eventually retaliated against me by filing their own complaints. <laughs> Currently, Hanover College is under investigation by the Office for Civil Rights for mishandling my case. I think it's pretty much been stated that sexual assault and due process on college campuses are both very serious issues, and they need to be taken seriously and discussed in a way that prohibits demagoguery and harmful rhetoric. They're also very controversial issues that need to be started with finding common ground. And I think for us that common ground is that everyone in this room, I'm sure, believes that sexual assault and rape need to be dealt with in a very serious way. But I think that we also agree that due process is a fundamental principle of justice in the United States, whether that's taking place on a college campus or in the criminal justice system. All too often, however, the disconnect comes when people start to put these two things together. Do the accused students on college campuses deserve to be presumed innocent, for example? Do they deserve the right to defend themselves? As uncontroversial as this statement might sound, it's not necessarily a given. In fact, for the last six years, it has been something of a debate and sometimes an exception to the rule on college campuses where due process rights were routinely restricted by colleges. This started with the 2011 Dear Colleague Letter, a guidance document produced under the Obama administration without proper regulatory procedures created to dictate how colleges handled sexual assault. Among other things, it established the preponderance of evidence, it restricted the right to cross-examine, and it encouraged what are called interim measures, which amounted to punishing accused students prior to a responsibility finding. The 2011 guidance, which has been at the center of the debate on college sexual assault, 
drastically tipped the scales of justice, so the accused students stood virtually no chance of defending themselves. But it also disenfranchised victims in many circumstances. It resulted in over 1,000 OCR complaints by alleged victims since 2011. As the Secretary of Education put in her 2017 speech at George Mason, it created a failed system. And though that guidance has been rescinded and replaced with interim measures, the problems persist. This failed system has led to a dramatic rise in lawsuits by accused students alleging due process violations. In 2017 alone, there have been about 30 lawsuits against colleges, and the vast majority of those have either resulted in a settlement or a favorable finding by the accused student. Just next door in the Sixth Circuit, as it was mentioned earlier, it was recently ruled that the University of Cincinnati violated a student's due process rights by denying him the right to cross-examine his accuser. Due process opponents frequently use the 2011 guidance as a shield, though, asserting that the guidance document supposedly discouraged these due process violations. However, they also supplement that statement by pointing out that only, only the bare minimum due process is required for a college adjudication to be fair. Personally, for me, that's never quite passed the smell test. As Americans, I think we can do better to protect our students. The culture that it created, compounded by an agency that so rarely uh, enforced or investigated due process violations on college campuses, allowed colleges with impunity to continue to restrict due process protections of students, knowing that they would never be punished for it. In my own experience at Hanover College, I was the victim of constant harassment by my fraternity and my assailant, which was never addressed by the college. My Title IX officer withheld pertinent evidence from me and my attorney, and two of the three members of the board that adjudicated my case were close personal friends with my assailant. These sorts of occurrences are not rare. In fact, in another case of which I am aware, a student was administered a polygraph test by a prominent former FBI agent, and he also took a toxicology test both of which would have proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that he had committed no crime. However, when presented with the evidence, the Title IX coordinator refused to even look at the document. In another case, a student who I know personally was tried and found not responsible by his school three separate times. This was in addition to a grand jury refusing to return charges against him. The existence has left him deeply scarred. Worse still, a student from UT Arlington named Thomas Clocky was accused without evidence of having used a homophobic slur. The administrative investigation by the school that followed was so mishandled and emotionally distressing that Thomas took his own life in June of last year. In a 2017 study conducted by the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which ranked schools on the due process protections found in U.S. schools, found that most colleges fail to provide even the most basic due process protections. 73% of schools surveyed do not guarantee at any point the presumption of innocence. Less than half of all schools surveyed did not require that their investigator and panel members be impartial and overall 79% of all schools surveyed received a D or F letter grade for protecting the due process rights of the accused. Two received a B and not a single school out of all schools surveyed received an A. In telling you all of these things, my goal certainly isn't to convince you that sexual assault on college campuses isn't a serious issue or that it shouldn't even be handled by colleges. It is a very serious issue, and colleges have a right and a duty to enforce their own policies. What I'm saying instead is that if colleges are going to continue to adjudicate these cases, they have to do it right with consultation from all sides involved. They have to go above and beyond to provide sufficient due process protections for both the complainant and the respondent and those schools like Hanover College, UT Arlington, and the University of Cincinnati who fail to do so 
must be held accountable by our federal government and the courts. The ideals of victims' rights and due process protections, which are sometimes used to divide us on this issue, are not mutually exclusive. They can both be achieved. It only takes all parties and their commitment to compromise, understanding, and compassion for all students. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. And uh, now we can take some questions from our audience. Uh, uh, Ms. Huff, if you have, you have a question. I do. Um, I actually have two that are very similar from two different questioners. So I was going to read both, but I think it's for all panelists. What constitutes consent from a woman to sexual activity? Is it the absence of no or don't do that, or must there be an affirmative yes? And then any advice for a parent with teenage daughters, how to warn them and or spot signs if they have been a victim? Uh, is that for any member of the panel? Um, if, let's go in reverse order. Uh, would you like to address the, the question, Mr. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of successful laws in certain states that require affirmative consent, which I think is appropriate. Um, and that isn't simply the absence of a no, that is an affirmative yes for a sexual act to be consensual. And I think that's, I mean, fairly correct, so. Yeah. Ms. Hunter, Ms. Howell? Um, in terms of Title IX, I'll just note that it can be different from school to school, the definition the school is working from. It's usually outlined in the student conduct, which code of conduct, which is of course something all students typically have to agree to and sign before attending. Um, so some schools have affirmative consent policies and some do not, and that's where to look. If you're visiting colleges with your college-age children and that's something that you're curious about, I would recommend reading through the suit of conduct to both see what the standard is and what the internal grievance procedure would be. I think it's fine. Um, a couple of things, too, are implicated in that question. There's criminal consent under Kentucky law, which has to do with forcible compulsion or other categories where you can't legally consent, um, including the relationship between the individual and the perpetrator, um, the age of the victim, and whether or not that person is, is physically helpless. Um, I will say that that the consent is a, that's a huge conversation. Um, and it's actually very related to the second question about how we speak to our youth. Um, and there's a lot of good positive research out there about how we can prevent sexual violence. And it begins often with teaching in age appropriate fashions consent to our boys and our girls. So as a parent, I've taught my kids that you don't have to give a hug, for example. Um, girls are socialized in our culture often to uh, to submit and to be hugged in different ways. Boys as well, boys are vulnerable in different ways, but um, you can do that in an age appropriate way. But the discussion of consent is really married to that prevention question. We as a culture too often have put the onus of prevention and in fact investigation and prosecution of sexual violence on the victims. So no other crime do you go to the hospital and have to collect your own evidence essentially of a rape that you are asked, do you wanna press charges when in fact that should be really the criminal justice system doing that. Um, and so too often we are teaching girls in really ways that are not evidence-based to say, hold your keys out in front of you, look around in your settings, don't drink, don't wear this, don't walk in certain places, don't be alone. Um, when in fact there's no evidence to say that that really prevents sexual violence and the, the true prevention that we can do is about consent and healthy relationships of both boys and girls. So those are rich discussions and there's a lot of good information out there and I would point you to Green Dot Kentucky, which precisely addresses that and it was born in Kentucky, implemented in Kentucky schools and has been proven to reduce sexual violence perpetration by over 50%. Wonderful strategy. Uh, thank you. Next question, Mr. Marks. Uh, this question is for any or all of the panelists. Is there any movement on the federal level to require reporting on the outcome of campus assault investigations? Um, there, there has been um, some discussion in federal legislation whether or not that, that is gonna come out is a harder part. 
um, whether it will be passed at, at the state level. Uh, General Bashir and our team have been litigating some transparency suits in state courts to uh, try to look at what are public records and whether our office has the ability to look at what's happening in college campuses. Um, but ultimately, I think it's going to have to be through some external review. When we look at other places that change the behavior, whether it's my Catholic church that changed its policies on sexual violence or the military, it took place through external, um, external pressure, either through lawsuits or congressional hearings. So I think it's going to take an act of Congress, um, both literally and figuratively, to compel universities to give that up. And, and uh, in deference to our universities, it is really hard. If you're touring a college campus and you're a parent, if you ask how many rapes were reported on campus, first of all, all the other parents are going to shudder. Second of all, the tour guide is probably going to want to say a low number. We have to let universities know that they can be transparent and we will understand that if they have higher rates of reporting, that is in fact a safer campus for our students. So we as a culture have to give permission to universities to deal with this in a healthy, transparent fashion. Um, sure. Um, I, I obviously I have to agree with Ms. Hunt on her original statement that transparency is a huge issue when it comes to sexual assault because really we don't know the full details of what colleges are keeping from us on this. And I'm, I mean, I think, I don't know if you've seen Yale, they have a very good transparency system. You can go and look and they'll tell you exactly what's happened um, and what the outcome of that was. And I think it's a very good model for all colleges to start using because unless we know the full details, we can't begin to, dis to solve this problem as a whole. Uh, next, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I might. I might just note that, however, um, w when I'm advocating on behalf of victims, privacy is often a very big concern, and I do think there should be limits to that transparency. So certainly the information colleges are, are providing to be more transparent shouldn't be enough that any individual victim or their circumstances could be identified by a friend or someone who happened to know that they played tennis or, or whatever facts are being disclosed by the university. It, um, I agree that transparency is important, but it should also be limited by a victim's right to privacy. Next question, please. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to group two uh, different questions just because they're similar. The first, though, is asked specifically to Gretchen. Um, it says, a student who was later proven innocent was expelled. The school never spoke to his witnesses and placed a gag order on him. How can we prevent this? in future campus cases and increase transparency and fairness. And then the other one, um, again, similar, what rights do wrongly accused persons have for recourse against college proceedings? So I won't speak to the facts of any other case without knowing, um, but, you know, it's interesting because, you know, anyone can make a complaint under Title IX of the Civil Rights Act. It's about fundamental gender or sex discrimination. So, for example, if there was a college campus that was rampantly running over the rights of male students, um, those male students could potentially file a complaint. There often, there's a right to an appeal under Title IX. Elizabeth can talk about that. Um, but I think we need to be cautious about sort of these terms that are tossed around around falsely accused. Um, the rate of false report, false reporting is not an issue in rapes. Let me repeat that. False reporting is not an issue of rapes, unless we're talking about problems of false reporting in tax fraud or robberies or any other crime. The rates per the FBI are between 2 and 8%, no higher than any others. So I would say that that's not a rape or sexual assault question. That's a question, you know, if someone's wrongly accused of any other <coughs> violation of the student code of conduct, follow that, per that same procedure, um, which would be dependent on the school. So I, I really want to push back a little bit on that narrative that I think we see far too often in the case of sexual assault and that chills reporting of victims from reporting to their colleges or to law enforcement, um, which endangers all of our safety. I, I, um, and the last thing I will say on that is that we have kits in the rape kit backlog that are campus kits. There are serial offenders on campus who then go on to serial perpetrate. So this is not just a campus sexual assault issue. This is a community safety issue as well. Would you like to address yes, that? Yes, I would. So I would like to touch very quickly on the, the three to eight or two to 10, whatever percentage it is of, of whatever you want to call them, false accusations of rape. 
The reality is there are no peer-reviewed studies that say that this is the percentage of rapes that happen on campus or the, the, the percentage of accusations that are false that happen on campus. But I'm not going to go into that. What I'm saying here is that it doesn't really, it, it shouldn't have a bearing on how we form our due process policies. Obviously, across the United States, false reports are low for any crime. That doesn't mean that we don't provide people with due process. And we have to remember at the end of the day that that 10 percent, those are people. Those are people whose lives could potentially be ruined. And if we aren't taking the steps, spe specifically for minorities, I think, who are at a greater disadvantage of being railroaded by these systems that are set up by I hate to say it, but by, by white institutions. Um, they are at a distinct disadvantage. They can't afford to hire attorneys to go up against the, the college. They don't know the policies. Some of them are foreign students. The, the point is that just because the percentage isn't high, we can't make it a non-issue. That, that's not who we are as Americans. We are due process. We are equality. And we are the presumption of innocence. And if I may, I'd like to ask the panel, because this issue was brought up, um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, specifically due process and appeal uh, from both parties, either the respondent um, or the, the, the survivor. Um, what's your take on what would be appropriate as far as appeal rights from, from, any, from all members of the panel? I'll go ahead and take this first. Um, so there are a number of different ways to enforce your rights under Title IX. The campus grievance procedure is usually the starting point. As was mentioned, um, either party can file a complaint with OCR if they're unhappy with how the university handled their case. They can also file a complaint in federal court. Um, typically, when we're talking about appeal and the grievance procedure, we're talking about a student's ability to appeal the outcome of the case as ruled on by the university hearing panel or adjudicator. Um, and my position is that certainly there should be a right to appeal. If I'm representing a victim and the respondent soccer coach is on the hearing panel and there's a not responsible finding, I'm definitely going to want to appeal that outcome and I have good cause to want to appeal that outcome. Um, I, it should absolutely, though, be equal. So if the respondent has a right to appeal, a victim should have the right to appeal as well sure um, the and I don't disagree with what Ms. Howell said uh, what I find a problem with is the appeal process itself generally especially at smaller colleges like mine where the appeal process moves from one office sitting here literally to the next office where these people are friends they're Facebook friends they go out to dinner that's not a fair appeal and if the appeal stops there that person isn't getting a fair shot at an appeal and, and the problem is, again, you know, I successfully filed an OCR complaint, and I'm getting remedies through that. And I'll later have the opportunity to sue the school if necessary. But the problem is, and in, I think Secretary DeVos said this herself, no student should have to sue their way to due process. That is not inexpensive. I'm familiar with a school, that, or not a school, a, a family that spent over a million dollars suing their school and lost. So. You shouldn't have to go into your retirement account or your grandparents' retirement account just to know that your school is treating your grandchildren or your children fairly. And if I might just briefly respond, I want to make it clear, different schools do handle appeals very differently. So the process, even between UK and UofL, it's going to be very, very different. Um, and it is important to note that appeals particularly can take a really big toll on victims of sexual assault. Some universities don't have limits on the amount of time times a respondent can appeal. So you could have five or six responsible findings that are continually appealed, which means your victim is having to testify to strangers about her assault five or six times. Um, many times universities are unfamiliar with their own appeals process and they're therefore very bad at updating the victim. So she may think he was found responsible, he's now off campus, it's over, and suddenly several months later learns, in fact, it's not over and there's been an appeal and she didn't receive notice of that appeal. 
And with regard to the appellate process and the entire process, um, stay tuned because our office will be conducting some work with at least public universities in Kentucky to try to gather more information so the public has more access of what do those processes look like. Um, we also <coughs> offer a lot of technical assistance connecting people there's some outstanding people doing really good work on due process. I'll, I'll cite an example, Transy University, their Title IX coordinator sits down with both parties, goes through the process, is able to do this in a really transparent way that's fair. Um, at the end of the day, you want both people to walk out of there with a sense of fairness, that the process was fair. You can do that, um, even if the outcome does not result in what the, what the victim or the respondent intended. Uh, I think we can agree that, that we want people to walk out of that proceeding with a sense that they were heard and that there was fundamental fairness. And there are good folks in Kentucky doing that and doing that in a very responsible way. So um, stay tuned for us producing more information for the public and for students about what their rights are and what the different processes are on public universities in Kentucky. And just a brief response. Just uh, really quickly, I do have to agree again with both of my fellow panelists. Um, first point is that these appeals processes are different from, from university to university and they could be right next door. Um, that's a fundamental problem with how the system is set up. But also the idea that, that victims are being re-victimized through all of these appeals process speaks to the fact that we have to get it right the first time. We shouldn't be giving people the opportunity to say, well, my rights were violated because of this, this, and this. All schools should have processes in place that ensure that they provide the maximum amount of process that minimizes appeals, minimizes re-victimization, and ultimately, I think, will bring us closer to a solution to this problem. Thank you. Uh, next question, please, Mr. Marks. We're running short on time, so this will probably be the last one. It's directed to Mrs. Hunt, uh, and it's a good way to wrap it up. How will we measure improvement on this topic in two, five, or 10 years? Increased reporting, um, increased public confidence in the system. Um, I don't think that will be decreased lawsuits. I think lawsuits are gonna proceed um, in our healthy and rich and vibrant legal culture that we have. Um, and increased um, access to prevention um, programs on all campuses. So if you had Green Dot happening at all public universities in Kentucky, you can measure that. And you can measure those rates by looking at what the military has done because they continually measure those those points. We're going to try to get a baseline of that this year in Kentucky and we'll be able to measure that going forward. Well, a quick round of applause <coughs> for our panelists. <laughs> Very important topic. I think it touches just about all of us. Um, we've got a gift for each of our speakers. Yes. And uh, here we go. This is a, um, a mint julep cup. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy those. Thank please, you. please join us next month when we'll be talking about violent crime in Louisville. Uh, we are adjourned.